Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and in today's Extreme Compilation, we have a story where somebody made Phosgene using a laser. Today's Yikes Awardee is Raxon Rodasivniv. There was one guy at work who was x-raying some welds. In order to do this, you need to have a very radioactive material. It's usually safe to do. However, this time, when the radioactive material was exposed, some piece of the metal fell onto the arm of it and caused the radioactive material to fall out. The guy saw what was happening and ran out as fast as he could, but was exposed for roughly 3 seconds. This resulted in 80% of his white blood cells being destroyed, and he will probably need to get checked for cancer in a few years. Yikes is right, that's terrifying. Now for the laser story. I'm not a chemist, but an engineer. The hazards I faced are caused by machines with nice visible dangers, making it easy to forget all the chemicals and solvents in a workshop. So, with so many heavy machines, it's sometimes easy to forget the most dangerous of them all, because it's near silent and its hazard is invisible to the human eye, the laser cutter. A machine that's designed to pump 200 watts of pure raw, below infrared light focused in a point less than a millimeter. This machine is where I have two lovely stories about going from oops to Houston, we have a problem. The first one is after moving departments around and expanding the main university workshop. Before this, the room was part of a control automation lab, where they had a big diesel generator as part of the equipment. This diesel generator was there since the design of the building, and was connected to an exhaust vent to get rid of the lovely diesel fumes. Rated for hot exhaust, it was perfect to repurpose to hook to the laser cutter onto, since nothing should share that exhaust pipe, right? Well, after fitting the filter system with an extra extractor fan, it turned out that something was connected to it the fume hood of the applied physics department that was used for experiments with chemicals and light radioactive materials such as radon gas and other alpha emitters. So three times a day for about two hours, instead of extracting fumes, the fume hood exhausting the smoke from the laser cutter and mixing it with whatever experiment was running in the fume hood, which caused quite an issue between the departments of the right to use the exhaust pipe. This leads us to the more serious issue, which is filling the large portion of the building with toxic fumes. Come back to the exhaust system. The air ventilation in general is designed for a green building, meaning minimal losses. The system they employed was by having a big suction vent from the ground floor to the top to collect all the air, run it through a heat exchanger and exhaust it, and having all the rooms add a positive pressure with fresh cool air. This was done because it increased the supply of fresh air to students, giving them an edge. However, no thought was given to labs and workshops. Cue the laser cutter again. There is a strict no PVC rule in the machine. This is a really important thing. If you're doing any sort of laser cutting, it's really important not to cut PVC pipe, and this story will help illustrate why. This was before the laser got moved, and due to space constraints, it was fitted with an air filter that exhausted into the room the laser was located in. The normal materials cut are PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, multiplex, stainless steel, polypropylene, and other materials that behave nice after being blasted with high intensity lasers. PVC is not one of those. Q1 student who thought that they had polymethyl methacrylate, not PVC, and a rush job with little time, so the material was not checked before loading it. Guess what? It was PVC, and its exhaust products penetrated the carbon and HEPA filters and exhausted back into the room. Oh no, this is terrifying. Within half a minute, the room was filled with a scent that was clearly toxic. The scent that made your nose hairs melt away. The machine was stopped, but the damage was done, and the workshop had to be evacuated because of the toxicity. Remember the air system? Well, because of that, the toxic air was pushed out of the room and into the hallways. Luckily, no one got injured. Those involved, among myself, got out of the room quick, and because of the positive air pressure, students in classes did not smell a thing. Yet everyone in the hallways had to leave the building. It was a bit of chaos, since no one really knew what to do in a toxic fume event. Anyway, recently I learned what PVC decomposes to when introduced to lasers. Among others, benzene, toluene, dioxane, xylene, phosgene, and hydrogen cyanide. I assume that this hydrogen cyanide is being formed through either nitrogen in the air or some sort of fillers, but the main thing I would be concerned about is the FOS gene. PVC stands for polyvinyl chloride, and when polyvinyl chloride breaks down, it can make hydrochloric acid as well as FOS gene, which is definitely something that you want to avoid. FOS gene was used as a chemical weapon in the past, and it's an extremely hazardous substance for people to work with. So therefore, if you're doing any sort of laser cutting, please do not cut PVC because it will put yourself and others in great danger. I was a pipe fitter in a DuPont plant in Laporte, Texas, where they made sulfuric acid, turned it into oleum, then used the oleum mixed with fluorospar and steam and created HF, and then fluorosulfuric acid, maybe. Whenever we worked on those pipes, we were in full acid suits, even with the suit, getting them onto you burned like hell, on bare skin, instant scarring, 
why are these people getting it onto their skin or the suit? Clearly, if like one person's wearing a suit and it's already like causing pain, that suit probably isn't doing enough. I've heard some crazy stories about the stuff that happens at DuPont before, but if you have any crazy industry stories, you should definitely leave them down below in the comment section. Otherwise, we have a channel in the That Chemist Discord where it's easier for us to filter through stories and it's easier for you to post images if you have any incidents in the lab or at your place of work. I am not jealous of the people working with HF or Oleum because both of those chemicals are completely terrifying to work with. Speaking of PPE, when I worked at the R&D center for a major oil company one summer, there was this one idiot who would steel toe boot check people by dropping a sledgehammer onto their toes. <laughs> this is so stupid. If the point of something is to protect people, you don't put them into harm's way just to check if they're compliant. That's really stupid. This place took PPE very seriously, so you never caught anyone with regular boots. Even the supervisor had steel toe dress shoes. Looking back, that place was nuts and not in a good way, in ways that I'm still just understanding. When I was an undergrad, before I did any research, I worked at this one tomato farm, and there was occasionally some safety violations, but uh, one thing that happened was, was the forklift was driven into the box making machine, and it actually pushed two of the conveyor belts together. It was like one of the loudest noises I've ever heard, because the forklift just slammed into the whole box making machine, and it moved the whole thing several inches forward. And this is like a multi-thousand pound machine. It's like impressive that this thing could move at all. And we had this really funny mechanic named Brian. Brian, if you're watching this, you're one of the funniest guys at that place. And he was not happy that he had to deal with that. You might have worked at a place before where it took a lot of work to get anyone just to do their bare minimum job. And Brian easily got tired of dealing with our sh Fortunately, I wasn't the forklift operator. However, I am forklift certified. This is not my story, but something that happened a good while ago in my university. Still insane. Back in the day, in lab classes for the first years, people would just throw into the sink all of the liquid waste, since the freshmen didn't work with organic solvents or metals, except for copper. They advised, of course, to let the faucet run a good while while doing so to dilute the waste so it didn't react with the plumbing. Turns out, 18-year-old fresh faces don't often hear things and ended up throwing stuff without diluting it enough. One day, because of whatever unholy concoction brew in those sewers, the pipe started spewing fire into several of the ground floor labs, simultaneously for nearly a minute. Oh no, this is not good. The pipe should never be on fire, please. Like, what are they even putting in there that could do that? That's just, like, terrifying. Unsurprisingly, after that incident, they started using proper waste containers for everything. The problem is that... Because of the really screwed up way the building was built, it's nigh impossible to replace the underground pipe without pretty much halting the whole class labs for at least a year, which is unfeasible. So, as far as we know, those pipes can be cracked and leaking all the wastewater into the soil, and we wouldn't know. However, the floor in the hallway is slightly bumpier in the middle. Uh, that is very sketchy. I know that there's some ways to do pipe repairs where they essentially, like, blow up and cure the pipe into an existing pipe, for exactly cases like this. I don't know if that would be applicable here because it sounds like there's some substantial damage to the soil underneath, or at least there could be. And yeah, it really makes me wonder what our piping system looks like underground, especially for the universities. I'm only a hazmat certified trucker and have curiosity about chemistry, which is why I'm here. But it's also scary to me, so I'm glad most of the dangers I face at work aren't chemical related, lol. These stories are terrifying, but I can't stop watching. Oh, there's one in here that isn't chemistry related. I've got a few then. One was before I was in trucking. I worked for a composites company building carbon fiber airframes for an airliner using giant robots. I mean, how is a carbon fiber airframe not chemistry related? That sounds pretty chemistry related to me. One day, we had something go wrong with one of the machines and one of the robots collided with another. Oh, this is almost exactly like my forklift story. I had been working on the stationary robot and thus was nearby. I was expecting the safety sensors to trip, but they were delayed. I ended up staring at a 10,000 pound robot 8 inches from my face when it stopped moving quickly toward me and everything shut down. That was a fun report to have to make, and I never fully trusted safety systems or anything programmed ever again. Honestly, I feel like anytime we do stuff, it's like our own programming that we've slowly been building, and I know I don't trust my own programming, let alone somebody else's. It's pretty scary what can happen with heavy machinery, and that also includes people driving places. Would love to tell you about my first bio lab job. That place was a mess. I worked in food safety, so most of our workplace hazards were very common. Worst I ever experienced was a few E. coli contaminations that I dealt with. Although the worst hazard wasn't what I dealt with, but was my other lab workers. We couldn't consistently get people to clean. 
There was food stains on everything, but the worst was the biohazard room. We typically use rough morphology to ID contaminated samples to help dial in what they might have been, if it was filler error or system sterilization errors. Basic gram staining was more than enough, like 70% of the time, but occasionally we'd have spore staining we need to do. That uses malachite green. Since a previous accident two years before I got there, our fume hood was destroyed, but we have a biological safety cabinet. The tech there just assumed that they're functionally identical, right? So when I got there and learned we were basically evaporating malachite green with no respiratory protection, I started causing a huge stink. There would also be green stains on everything. Since the malachite was the only green thing we had in the lab, I was horrified to clean a random surface and see my paper towels mysteriously turn green. Ugh. The worst contender was the fact that our DI water sink, the only one in the facility, had odd green staining in the tubes coming from it. I'm guessing a previous tech probably washed something covered in it and let it go into the piping. Who knows how contaminated all the DI was there. So malachite green appears to be pretty toxic. And if this LD50 on Wikipedia is correct, 80 milligrams per kilogram, this is definitely not something you want to have coating your entire lab. That is definitely spooky and... This is why we have things like OSHA, and this is why we have safety teams that overlook the experiments that you do in your lab. What if we just start breeding sulfur and become sulfuric life? I don't know if that would work, but it sounds like a stinky idea. I'd like to thank all of the patrons who support the channel on Patreon. Your support helps us continue making this series, and I really appreciate your continued support. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.